Good morning. <laughs> this is what you call a small but select group of uh, worshipers. So I want to welcome you, those of you who braved the elements to be here this morning. It's very good. And I want to tell you, this is about 100 degrees warmer than the other side of the building, so uh, enjoy being in the sanctuary. Um, it, thank goodness Dave came in and reset the button for us this morning on the boiler, or it would have really been cold everywhere. I'd like to call your attention to the announcements that are in the back of the bulletin, and there are some others to add to it. <clears throat> uh, obviously, we want you to sign the Friendship Register. The youth and college age group meeting at one to help prepare the spaghetti dinner, and I just want to reiterate on that, that at one o'clock, we're going to start preparing the meal that we will be serving the jail and the fire department, and anyone who can help is very welcome. If you have a hat or a bandana for your hair, please bring it. You don't have to wear hair nets, but you do have to wear something over your hair. And um, we do have hats. I brought some hats and some bandanas for people who might not have them at home or may not, may not be going home again. Um, this morning when we have communion, we're going to do it slightly differently since we're the smaller group. Uh, if you can and feel comfortable, come down for, uh, in, by intinction, to have communion. Otherwise, if you uh, feel like you'd rather stay at your seat, they will come to you and serve you at your seat. So you can have it whichever way you prefer. Um, I'd like to also announce that the elders are having a called meeting tomorrow evening at 7.30. So if you are an elder, please keep that in mind. The uh, JYF, which usually meets in the afternoon on Sunday from 3 to 5, is canceled today. Um, but if there are any of the youth that want to come and help decorate the uh, cartons for the, the uh, spaghetti, well, we'll certainly put you to work. Um, also, uh, Char has asked that I announce to you that Jean Moore is having a birthday on February 14th, Valentine's birthday, and she talked with her daughter and her daughter said that she would bring uh, Jean here on that date. So we're going to have a little surprise birthday party for Jean, and it'll be from two to four here in the church parlor on the 14th of February, which is Valentine's Day. So that's, all, that's on the basis that the roads are good, the weather's all right, and Jean's feeling well enough to do this. So those are all caveats that we have for it. But if you're here, uh, please come and join us to celebrate Jean Moore because she's been a dedicated member of this church for many years and this has been a very rough year for her over this last year. Um, also, I want to remind you that uh, this is the Super Bowl of Caring today and that the youth have had uh, boxes, I think, at each of the doors for cans of soup, if, if you remembered to bring those with other things. Uh, food or financial donations can be made at each of the doorways and the, the youth will gladly accept your gifts before and after the service. So, And then uh, all services and special presentations, including last week's service of rededication and State of the Church address, are on the Internet. So go to our Facebook web uh, page, and, uh, and that's fccmacomb.org. And if you click on the link, you can watch that if you missed it or if you just want to relive it for yourselves. Um, are there any other announcements at this point? I'm laughing because I'm seeing somebody fanning that they're hot, and I'm, that's, that's good, <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, oh, I also want to mention that there's a uh, Christian education meeting at 6.30 tomorrow evening. If the new children's minister, she's, she would be here this morning, but she's been ill, and um, she said that she, her mom actually called and left a message for me yesterday, and then she texted, that uh, she didn't think that we would appreciate her bringing the bug with her to church. So um, she's, if she's feeling better, then there will be a meeting tomorrow at 6.30. Any other announcements at this point? Okay. We're only going to sing today the, the first and last, did we say? The first and last uh, verse of each of the hymns. We decided that that would be easier for everyone. And uh, given all of that, I think we're ready to hear the prelude and prepare our hearts and minds for our worship this morning.
If you are able, will you please rise and join me in the call to worship? This is the Lord's Day, a Sabbath from the demands of routine. This is the Lord's space. It is sacred and holy place. We enter into our church to focus on the one who renews our hearts. We are the Lord's people, and we are here to encounter the God who speaks and who knows our name. Our opening hymn, and again we're going to do the first and last verses, is number 22, All Creatures of Our God and King. Shall we continue our worship together by the reading of the invocation in unison? We praise your holy name, gracious God. We are blessed richly when we gather to worship and have this opportunity to thank you for who you are and what you have done and continue to do for us. Open our minds and hearts to what we might do for you through helping your children near and far. Amen. I invite the young people to come and join me here in the front. Thank you, Carol. I forgot to tell you there weren't any children, children, little kids. But hey, I'm really glad that this is the age group that we're talking to today because I think you might know this game that I want to talk about. Do you know rock, paper, scissors? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, tell me what this is. Paper. paper. Okay, and what does paper do? Covers. Covers rock. What's rock? Can you show me rock? This one. Okay, right. Are you all following this? Okay, and then what's the third one? We have rock, scissors, okay. And what happens to scissors? What can hurt scissors? What? Rock. What does rock do? Crushes scissors, scissors cuts paper, and paper, and what? Perfect, oh good job, paper covers rock. I don't know how long it's been since any of you played this, but this is good, good backup information. Okay. Uh, 
you two both know how to play it. Well, all three of you do. Let's have, can you stand up for a minute so everybody can see right there where you are? All right. Up on the steps, then they can see a bit. All right. I want you to face each other, and I want you to do, whoop, why don't you come around here? Yeah, then we can get you all in. Okay. All right. Let's do it. Rock, paper, scissors. One, two, three. Da. Okay. So we've got paper, paper, rock. You guys covered it. Now, what happens if you win? Do you know? Yeah, what happens? Yeah. <laughs> you forgot. Okay, do you remember? No, do you? you usually like, you're usually like doing this to get over something or one thing. Different, so you usually get that thing. Okay. Uh, you, you can win, and then so you get whatever your choice is. Or sometimes when you're playing it and if you're mean, then you hit each other with on the on the wrist with it, and that, we're not going to do that. Uh uh, that hurts. Okay, now let's do it one more time. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, we got scissors, cuts paper. Oh, you got both of them. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. You can sit down. Why I'm talking about this is because we want to talk about strength. In uh, part of the scripture we're going to have this morning. Uh, the scripture says, the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching, and with authority, even gives orders to evil spirits, and they obey them. And this is talking about when Jesus was visiting in the synagogue with them, and there was a man who had an evil spirit in him, and he actually said to the evil spirit in the man, come out, you're going to be out of this. So Jesus was stronger than the evil spirit. So it's kind of like rock, paper, scissors. He was paper over the rock at this point. Or he was scissors cutting the paper. Sometimes you have the opportunity to be stronger than something bad. If you have a friend that somebody's saying nasty things to or not good things or not kind things, what could you do, do you think? Tell an adult. Okay, you could tell an adult. What else could you do? Anything? Can you think of? Tell an adult is a good thing. Could you be nicer to that person who somebody was being not, not nice to? Yeah. Would that make you stronger or weaker, do you think? It would make you stronger, yeah. That's exactly right. You could also stand up to the person who's being mean to her. Very good. You could stand up to and that would make you stronger as well. And that person that you're helping to protect would know that someone loved them, right? And somebody was helping take care of them. Well, that's the way Jesus is with you. You are the people that he cares about and that he wants to protect. And his strength is there for you against evil. So as you go through this week, and you might not have school tomorrow, who knows? As you go through this week and you see people around you, and even, I think about you two guys. You have a little brother. Do you sometimes help protect him? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I won't even ask. <laughs> okay, but you, but you do, I'm sure. If somebody else was trying to do something bad, you wouldn't let them do it to your brother, would you? No, I'm sure you wouldn't. As you go through this week, I want you to look for chances to be stronger, to be representatives of Jesus, and have your voice heard if somebody's doing something to someone else or to you or to someone that you care about. Protect them, okay? Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father, help us to show Jesus' love as he showed your love. Help us to follow the, his example and use our strength to help others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. It was great. Good morning. Good morning. We kind of filled in here a little bit. And Rich and Brianna must have come in late because I wouldn't have let you sit in the back row. 
Welcome, everyone. Thank you for making it through the sludge and the trudge and everything else you had to do to get here, especially to the choir members, because it's such an important part of our worship service. And, and to uh, Carol and John Harmon for coming from Canton. Totally did not expect that this morning. I was wondering how we were going to, and then they showed up. And here they are, so I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for everyone to be here. I'm grateful for Tim Adams, who's upstairs running sound and video and sweltering in the heat upstairs. So uh, those of you who are, who are used to sitting upstairs may be grateful that you're sitting downstairs today. It's pretty warm. Uh, prayer concerns, as we know them at this time. Uh, got a call from Bonnie Becker. She is the wife of Chuck, who has a son named Brad Becker, who is suffering from liver cancer, and they want all of our prayers. And so, Phyllis, if we could add Brad Becker liver cancer to the prayer chain this afternoon, that would be really great. And uh, so we will keep him in our prayers. Um, we've already heard about Jean Moore this morning. Um, heard a good report that she's getting a little stronger and eating a little more solid food. Char got that report, and so we're grateful for that. Manil McClure, we keep on our prayers, um, on our prayer chain and in our hearts. Jean Cooper, who has been kicked out of his cancer study, um, and they're trying to uh, get his kidney function better, and so once he gets stronger, he'll be able to go back and, and treat his cancer, but for now, they're just going to treat the kidneys, and uh, at least that's uh, how I understood it. He's going to be seeing a local doctor. No more trips to St. Louis for a while. He had 26 trips to St. Louis in 11 months. Yeah, you, <laughs> they know the way. They just point the car, and it kind of takes them. So we're grateful that he doesn't have to travel so much, but we are hopeful that his... Uh, body will begin to respond and react in, in good ways for him. We keep Glenn Prodder, um, Teresa Muneer, um, Bob Blancett, Nita Berg in, um, uh, in our prayers. Rod says that Nita will see your doctors this week, and we're grateful that her surgery went so well last week, and we just keep you both in our prayers, Rod. I would also mention Andy Taylor to you, who is going tomorrow to figure out something more with a plan on the knee, probably a surgery coming up soon. And um, a friend of mine who happens to be the minister at Scotland, Trinity Presbyterian, um, was playing basketball last Sunday night and broke his leg and had surgery this week. So if they're actually having church out that way, because it could be pretty treacherous out in the country, um, they're having to have a, a guest minister for the next couple of weeks. So, um, But Gary and I are good colleagues, good friends, and so my heart goes to him. I've taking him a couple of meals this week just to check in on him and, and all of that kind of stuff. Someone asked me, was he playing basketball with you? <laughs> because if so, then you may be the, and it wasn't me. I wasn't there. He was playing with someone else. So Andy's the only one who can be blamed on me. We have four people who are um, at a regional youth event. We have 125 people from our denomination at a regional youth event at First Christian Church in Springfield. My wife is hanging out with the Loop's grandchildren. She's having a blast with uh, your granddaughter. So uh, anyway, they are headed back today, so we are hopeful for safe travel for them. Are there any other prayer concerns this morning? Let's just breathe. Sometimes snow can be stressful, but sometimes it can force us to just be still, not do as much, not be so crazy chaotic with our schedule and just, you know, the calm people are at home. We're the crazy ones. We got out in it. <laughs> but in the beauty of this place, let us come into the beautiful presence of our God. Let us begin our morning prayer in silence. Good and gracious God, we come into this house of worship today, your home, a place where we come face to face with you and we lift up our hearts and our minds and our souls to you. We pray for all those that we've just named and we pray for those whom we have left unnamed, for those who 
are hurting in silence, for those who may have a medical issue that they haven't shared, for those who are feeling completely and totally alone. Be with us this day as we come into your presence. We may be small in number, but we are here because we love you. We're here because we need you. We desire to have you in our lives. We are looking to know that you are real. The world around us will tell us so many different ways that you're not, that they will ridicule us for even considering to be your people, to be your followers, to be your faithful ones. So come to us today and make yourself known. Help us to find something to hold on to. We come into the beauty of this place and we center ourselves, we sit in silence. Probably something we should do a little more often, God. Our schedules are full, our tablets and our phones and our computer screens are in our face all the time. We hardly get a break from media, email, social conversations, texts. <coughs> so as we take that break, may something amazing happen. May something wondrous happen in this worship today. That all the things we ask for, this closeness, this reality of your presence, that they can become true, that we will know you, and it will make a difference to how we can live in this world. That would be amazing, that we could think of you first when making any decision, that we could think of you first when determining how to act in this world, that we could think of you first when we wake up and start our day how amazing would that be that in many small ways that we as a church could do great things. So be with us this day as individuals, as a church. Draw us closer to you and do something amazing within us. We pray this in the name of the amazing one, the one that we call Christ and Savior, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, the rest from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Absolutely beautiful. Thank you very much. Our scripture is in the bulletin, if you'd like to read along. It is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. I am going to have you have this in hand today, because I'm going to ask you questions. It might even ask you to refer back to it. So if you don't like this, you can pick up the Bible in the pew if you want, or if you brought your own. But we have it for you. And so um, pay attention to it today. You might get called on. Ha, 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 ha. All right, let's read. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. May God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word this day. You may be aware of the fact that we have the lectionary, it's a common lectionary, in which we use to choose scriptures for the services. It's a three-year cycle that over the three years you will actually hear every verse of every book in the Bible. And so right now during this cycle, this particular scripture is for today, the gospel scripture. If you turn to page 186 in your hymnal, The hymn on page 186 is obviously for this scripture, but it's kind of obtuse, and it's a very different contemporary text by a man named Thomas Troger, who I've heard speak many times, actually is also Kristen a flute player, Thomas Troger, you flute players, we have three, three flute players in the choir. The Carol Doran melody paints this picture of this spirit, the unclean, frenzied spirit, frenzied, unclean spirit, by using what we described in choir practice as a nagging note. You can see that the note and the melody is repeating. And you'll hear that the notes and the accompaniment are kind of clashing, very dissonant. Uh, I've taught the song to the choir so they can sing it for you because it's a little difficult for the first time uh, congregation to sing it. But if you want to follow along and perhaps join us on the second and third verse, if you feel comfortable doing that, 
I think it's very important for you to hear this hymn, which starts off telling about the scripture, and then in the second and third verses, has verses that say what the scripture has to do with our lives. What did you think of that? It was good. A little dissonant. I'm going to ask the choir to come down and sit in the center section, please. Not only have you done double duty, now you have to move. Thank you for doing double duty, though. That was a, a great piece. Bill, thanks for bringing that to us. It's possible that's what it sounded like for the demons, you think? I wonder. All right, so our sermon title today is Astounded, and we take that from, um, in the scripture, you will have read in the first few words, that when Jesus was teaching, they were, okay, let's try that again. When Jesus was teaching, they were, I told you this was going to be class participation today, so you're going to have to pay a little more attention, I know the choir's moving, so they were astounded. Jesus was teaching and they were astounded. So um, I looked up the definition of astounded, and it is um, to shock or greatly surprise. To shock or greatly surprise. Give me what you think might be synonyms for astounded. Astonished. Amazed. Shocked. How about confounded? Dumbfounded. Stupefy. Stupefy. What a great word that is. Just say it. Stupefy. You feel better for having said it, don't you? It's a great word, stupefy. To be made almost stupid by a, something that you see happening, something that shocks you, amazes you, confounds you, dumbfounds you. Something that comes. Um, in our world, I think we're shocked and amazed very little these days. I think we're shocked and amazed very little. We have a 24-hour news cycle. 
So if something happens, we're going to know about it, and within 10 minutes, we will have heard the story repeated, 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 and a day later, we can hear the same story and the same experts and the same repetition of that story. It doesn't surprise us anymore. Not like in the day when you opened up your newspaper to the front page to see what had happened in the world. Today, you know it before the newspaper ever arrives at your doorstep. Do you agree with me? Do you think that it takes a lot to really shock us these days? Um, what, What was the last thing to shock you, to startle you, to stupefy you? to astound you. Can anyone think of anything? The shuttle blowing up? That was when I was a freshman in college. (laughs) I only point that out because that's how old I am too. But it's taken that long for something, nothing has astounded you since, I wonder. 9-11, 9-11, okay. Oklahoma bombing. Oklahoma bombing, that was near and dear to my heart. Did you know that my mother worked for the state and was supposed to be in that building that day? Oh. You didn't know that. I just astounded you. <laughs> I'm just joking. What else? I think All the stuff with ISIS right now? Yeah. Any of that good? Mary said the Benghazi thing that happened. Is any of this good? Is there anything positive about these events? Like, there are sometimes positive things that come out of those events, but the events themselves, there's nothing positive in those. Try to think of something that was good that astounded you. For those of you who happen to be parents... Maybe the birth of a child. What they can do with the human heart today. Well, that's close and dear to your heart with your wife having heart surgery this last week. What they can do with the heart. So science and technology. The Mars rover. The Mars rover. I'm So the talent of young people that you can see on YouTube and on websites and different things like that, that never would have been possible even 20 years ago. Someone was going, I saw a hand. We just returned from the Illinois Music Education Conference with the All-State Honors Ensembles in Peoria. The music made by those high school students was astounding. The Honors Orchestra did a movement from a Mahler symphony. So music by the Illinois State um, High School students this last week. There was a piece, if you didn't hear, and I couldn't tell you the name of the composer. So So there are some things. Um, You know, I think that also, though, uh, when it comes to faith, I think there are moments that we're supposed to be astounded in our faith. I think that we're supposed to have these holy moments where we go, OMG, and we mean it. Where we go, oh my God. Christmas and Easter? Well, hopefully. But do we get that as much at church or at the family dinner table? Or is it both? I think it should be both. I'm not trying to say. But our family traditions and our things. Um, so Christmas Eve and Easter in our, in our church calendar, those are the easy ones for us to think of. But when else? Baptism? Is that a moment that should astound us? I think so. And I don't think it matters whether you're the one being baptized or you're witnessing it. For a person in our day and age to want to step up and say, I believe in God as revealed in Jesus Christ, to be able to say that today, especially for a young person, with all the pressure, with all the science and technology that amazes us and astounds us and takes us further and further away from faith, I think sometimes... That for someone 
to step into that baptistry to say, I believe, and I'm going to live my life in such a way to believe. That should be an astounding moment. An astounding moment. In our story today, we find that those gathered at the synagogue in Capernaum were astounded by the teaching of Jesus, but they were astounded because he taught as if he had authority. Did you catch that little part? Who is Jesus set up against in those first few verses? There's a group of people mentioned that they don't have authority. Did you catch it? Scribes. The scribes don't have authority. They just retell the word. They retell the teachings that they've been told. I never even come close to falling up here, but I'm going to fall on these steps today. Uh, they never add anything. They, never, they just retell what they know. It's rote. It's like an English lesson. It's like a foreign language lesson. It's like a science lesson. They tell with a lot of, um, without much personality, without imparting much to the story. They just, the scribes retell and retell and retell. And, and after a while, if you heard the same old story over and over and over, you would stop listening, right? Especially if you didn't think that person really had much authority. Well, Jesus comes into the temple where the religious leaders are, and he starts teaching, and he teaches as one who has authority. That's what this whole chapter is about. And in fact, um, that's what the, the commentator would say. Our story is about Jesus' authority, his authority to tell the story of God as if he understands it in such a way that no one else did. Hmm. Early on, his baptism and the spirit descending like a dove shows his authority, his overcoming the temptations in the, in the desert with the Satan shows his authority. And now to be able to be in the temple and teach in such a way that people are astounded. And then to have an unclean man in the temple, which by the way, I just wonder if that would have happened very often because they would have kept the unclean people out of the temple because it's too pure. So to have an unclean person in the temple when Jesus is there is kind of an amazing thing. But, but this man is there and Jesus says, spirits leave. But only after they say, what do you have to do with us, O Jesus of Nazareth, O Holy One of God? Again, imparting this understanding of who Jesus is, the, the, the demons get it. And the temple authorities don't. Mark is setting up this, this whole power play from the very beginning of chapter one. Jesus has all the authority, and those who are the, are the temple religious authorities, they don't have any. The chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, these are the people who are supposed to know best. They, the demons know better than they do. So this whole thing, this whole astonishing amazing experience is to elevate Jesus in the eyes of those who will read this story. Remember, the story is written 25 to 30 years after his death. And so people who didn't have a firsthand experience are trying to get a grip on who this Jesus of Nazareth was. This guy who came a few years ago that they didn't hear teach, Think about it for yourselves. You don't have that first-hand experience of hearing Jesus teach. You're reading these words. I wonder if you ever read them and were amazed, astounded. It's so hard because we know the end of the story. We start as an Easter people. We start knowing the end of the story. It would have been so nice not to have heard the stories growing up or to not have friends who were Christian who invited us to their Easter worship every once in a while, or, but to be able to open the Bible for the first time and read that story. Jesus was baptized. He taught with authority told demons to go, and they listened, and they knew him. Did you ever have that teacher who just got to you? We have so many educators in this room right now. 
whether you be Sunday school educators, children's church educators, or actual professional educators in the school system, there are so many of you sitting in the room. I am sure that some of you have been that person to someone. But can you think of that person for you? Did anyone, when I asked the question, oh, that teacher, that, did you have someone stand out? Who was it, Rich? Who stood out for you? What's his name? Uh, Chris Azera. Chris Azera, your mentor who put you on the musical path that you're on now to teach and experience music in such a way. Mary, how about you? Yes, I think the, uh, the head of the department in the home economics department uh, was a mentor of me. At WIU? At home, and look at you, the career that you've made out of that. Anyone else? Colin? I know. You're the youngest in the room, that's why I came to you. No, you're not, Brianne is, but I'm still coming to you. Who's your favorite teacher? Well, I'd have to say, I do Okay. Your current biology teacher? Yes. What's his name? Mr. Bunsen. Mr. Bunsen. I had Mrs. Randall when I was in second grade. Mrs. Randall was so cool when she told my mom really nice things about me. I liked her a lot. <laughs> when I was in high school, we had a math teacher. I hate math, but you know, I was on a first name basis with my math teacher. Her name was Tracy Hendricks. But maybe my favorite high school teacher was my choir director, Buddy Watson. I was also on a first name basis with him. He would get so into what he was doing. And if we were messing around in class some days, he was a bald man. I'm sure not all choir directors are like this, but he was a bald man. And the veins would stick out like an inch if he got upset with us. And he, oh, it was so much fun to watch. <laughs> but he loved what he was doing. And then in college... I had a man named Frank Gorman who was my religious um, studies professor and he was also my uh, advisor and he was also my mentor. And uh, it was something to be with him, to hear him bring the Bible to life, to hear the stories in such a way, to expect so much out of us as students, I was at a school that had a seminary, so Phillips University, and then there was Phillips Theological Seminary, and one year we had a class, and it was half filled with seminarians and half filled with us who were um, under class. And, and Frank didn't usually teach in the seminary, but he was the one teaching this class, and so we were in class, and there was this man who was probably 20 years older than me, who probably was a second or third career person and coming into the seminary, and, and probably bivocational at that point, taking classes and working in the professional world is still having to work in a church and um, and he said some kind of, you know, he said some things in class that seemed how do we say without sounding snobbish a little introductory like something we learned as first semester freshmen you know, we'd been with the great Frank Gorman for three years, and, and, and this guy is just, you know, saying some things. And, and um, I didn't necessarily even think that what he was saying was very correct, but we were there, right? And I'm listening, and I'm seeing this, and, and Frank is going, oh, well, that's such a good point, and, you know, kind of draws him into the conversation. I saw Frank later that night in our student union, he was sitting with the sociology professor standing, actually, as we were getting ready to have a rally on campus for some reason. And I walked by and I was like, Frank, what was up with that? You let that guy get away with that. If that had been one of us, you would have lit into us. And he was like, and he got right in my face. And he said, and you're right, Kelly Ingersoll. And you tell all of my um, underclass religious majors, that if they ever let one of those seminarians get away with that kind of asinine comment again, I'm going to flunk all of you. Okay. <laughs> but he loved the Bible. And he loved teaching. 
We've all had those moments where we sat in the presence of someone who taught and we were astounded and we were amazed and don't you wish that Jesus could be the one who astounded you and amazed you that you could have been a first generation follower sitting in his presence hearing him say, blessed are the meek and the mild and here, think about God in this way and to have known his authority in your heart, so deep in your heart. I'm sometimes so jealous of those folks who got to sit and listen to him teach, to be there. The miracles, those would have been amazing too, don't get me wrong. But the teaching, I think, would have affected me even more. Mike Iaconelli has a book called Dangerous Wonder. I have preached from this. I have told stories from this. But the whole premise of the book is that we should be so amazed by faith that we should have such holy moments in faith that we are shocked, amazed, astounded, stupefied by what we see and experience. He compares that to his nephew, who at the time was two years old and was being bundled up by his aunt and his mother to go out onto the deck for the first time to experience snow. Have you had a child in your family that you got to have that experience, that snow, that experience of snow for the first time? Have you seen that sense of wonder in that child's eye? I've seen it in the eyes of puppies. (laughs) It's the same thing. An aside, my dog Molly, she was a puppy when we rescued her, and um, she came with us to Oklahoma. And it's not snow that I'm going to talk about, but my sister had a pool, has a pool in her backyard, and I was in it, I guess. I can't remember. I was either in it or standing on the other side of it. And um, Molly looked at it, and she thought it was solid. And she put that first paw, like she was running, and she put that first paw down, and that second paw went, and then her eyes, fear, absolute fear. And she dug in her back claws in the concrete and tried and tried and tried not to fall in, but it was way too late. And she was in before she even knew what had happened. And she was, (gasps) good thing she could swim. She figured out how to swim. He talks about his nephew, Iaconelli talks about his nephew um, being bundled up and everybody being at the ready. His mom had gone out on the deck and had the camera. The aunt was holding the child's hand and about to take him out the door. The father was going to open the screen door to let the child out and he, the uncle, was going to flip on the light. He writes these words. Wonder filled the air. His eyes stretched with wide astonishment as though the only way to apprehend what he was seeing was for his eyes to become big enough to contain it all. He stood motionless, paralyzed. It was too much for a two-year-old, too much for an any-year-old. Too often when a person gets older, the person's too much detector. Malfunctions corroded by busyness and technology. He twitched and jerked each time a snowflake landed on his face, feeling it tingle as it was transformed from hostile cold to friendly warmth, caressing his face with tiny droplets of water. Just behind his large eyes, you could see the sparks flying from the cross currents of millions of electronic stimuli overwhelming the circuit breakers of his previously small world. His mind was a confusion of strange, conflicting realities, white, cold, Floating, flying, tingling, electric, landing, touching, sparkling, melting. This caused an overload so great, so overwhelming, that he fell backward. A slow motion landing in the billowy whiteness, the snow tenderly embracing him. He had given up trying to understand snow and had given in to experiencing Snow, get that. 
he had given up trying to understand snow and had given in to experiencing snow. It was a moment to wonder. He goes on to talk about all the people who must have been amazed by their experiences with God, Adam and Eve, when they first got to glimpse the garden, the, um, the paralytic who was healed, the man who had um, blindness and the scales fail, the prostitute who was supposed to be judged and killed was given forgiveness and grace and love. He says that those are wonderful moments of forgiveness and life. And what moments? What holy moments? To be in the presence of God, frightened and amazed at the same time. To feel as if you are in the presence of life itself, yet with your soul shaking in both terror and gratitude. I want a lifetime of holy moments, Iaconelli writes. Do you want a lifetime of holy moments? Have you even experienced one? I'm sure you have. But if it's been a long time ago, it may be time to be astounded and amazed. We have a big day. There's this thing that's gonna happen tonight. Katy Perry's gonna sing. (laughs) Some guys are gonna play some football. But what's more astounding is that this morning we have the opportunity to make a difference for people in our own community by bringing soup and money and canned foods. That there are churches all over the country that are going to have the SOU Super Bowl of sharing instead of worrying about $4 million commercials. That should be what amazes us today. That we have the possibility at one o'clock to come back here, anybody, any age, but especially college age and youth and elders, to come back here at one o'clock and cook food for people we don't even know, that we don't even see, that if we passed them on the street, we wouldn't know that they've been in prison, or maybe they're going back someday. But to provide for them a little relief, a little opportunity around this football game to have a home-cooked meal and to know that someone across the street cares. That would be astounding. That's what should be amazing today. It can't just be our confessions of faith and our baptisms. We have to have more holy moments closer to our current day. I'll share one story and then I'll get out of your face. But The holy moments are so important because not only do they lift us up and give us more strength and courage to move on, they impact the others with whom we share them. I was on a mission trip to New Orleans one time. It was our first mission trip when I was serving at Country Club Christian Church and um, we went for a week each November for the first three years after the hurricane. That first year was horrible. I'm not, it was horrible. We were there about 60 days after the hurricane, and all we did was pick up stuff and take it to the curb. Wet, gross, nasty, dirty, moldy stuff. And when I call it stuff, what I really mean is people's life. Families' memories. Bibles. Wedding albums diplomas, certificates, clothes, you name it. We took it out to the street. And the reason we took it out to the street was because there were only 150,000 people in New Orleans by, day, by night. There were 300,000 people by day. The goal was for people to work, right? Well, the only thing to work on was to pick up trash, take it to the dump, and get paid by the pound. That's why 150,000 people came in every day to pick up people's lives and take it to the dump. And we were there. 
It wasn't rebuilding. It wasn't doing any of that stuff yet. It was too soon. It was too soon. We picked up their stuff. We took it to the road and waited for someone to come by and take it to the dump. It was so hard to do. Our last day of work, we went to a home and we were pretty good at it by this time. And it was the first time that we were working as a total group. We had been split up between two or three different homes each time. In neighborhoods, we went, we went two days without seeing one person. That's how desolate the neighborhoods were. Not even one person showed up during the time that we worked at this one house for two days. Oh, and by the way, if you ever go 60 days after a flood and someone says, don't open the refrigerator, take their word for it. <laughs> I have never smelled anything as horrific as a refrigerator that had floated in sludge, landed on its back, and then when we tried to pick it up, it opened. We had to leave the house. Last day, we went to Laura's house. All the other days, we hadn't really worked with any of the owners. One group got lucky enough to work with one owner to put a face, to have a name, to see something, to see the gratitude of this person who we were taking his whole life out, but that wasn't my group. We got to work alongside Laura. She had a three-bedroom, two-bath house with a garage that was full of stuff, and we, in half a day's work, emptied it completely and totally. We gathered to take a picture with Laura, and before we could have the picture, she took the floor, if you will. And she said, you know what? I had to leave my home. I had to get out of town. I had given up hope. I had given up on God. I was looking for a new way to live, and you've changed me today. Today I know that someone still cares. Today, for the first time in two or three months, I felt the presence of God in my life. You think we were amazed? Astounded, the simple act of picking up someone's wet trash and taking it to the curb. We were filled up inside. And it sounded as if she was too for the first time in a long time. We may not have heard Jesus' teaching in our own ears, but we have read, and we know how to live in this world in such a way that God's love and God's grace and God's peace can be known, God's hope can be known in this world. Amazing. Astounding. Let us be the faithful followers that we have been called to be from the very first time we ever said, I believe in God as revealed in Jesus the Christ. For if we can do that, the world will be different in small ways, in big ways. May it be so. And may it be amazing. Amen.
please be seated as we gather around the table. I will remind you this morning that you'll be invited to come forward and share in communion by antiquation, taking a piece of the bread and dipping it in the cup and being close to this beautiful communion ware. If you prefer to remain at your seat, you will be um, greeted by a deacon who will bring you uh, the communion as we traditionally take it. You will also note that if you come forward, there are a few wafers on the table, on, on the plate. If you, if you prefer a wafer, you could take that and dip it in as if you don't want to tear off. But there are only about six or eight of those, so um, sorry about that. The first six or eight get those. We come to this, what I consider to be the most holy moment of our worship that if we're to be amazed and astounded in any way, it's right here because God is the one who invites all of us to this table. No matter who we are, no matter where we've come from, no matter what has happened in our lives, we can come to this table and we can know those gifts that we want to share with the world. We can know them in a personal way. It can be an amazing moment. So may it be that for us today, that we will come into the presence of God as we share this holy communion. Shall we pray? Gracious and merciful God, we gather at your... (laughs) congregation to praise you, to give you thanks, and to receive your blessings. As you have provided food for our table, You provided us with the scriptural food. This bread that we break now, sensifies our confidence with Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, you have sent us. Let us praise and endure forever. Amen. Ever powerful God. We gather in your presence here in this house of worship this morning. Give us confidence and strength and of faith. Help us to learn to trust you are always there even when we doubt. We confess that sometimes we are weak and we lack the confidence to take that next step. Proof that we can do difficult things with your help, the things that we may have doubted before now, now surrounds us. With your leading, we are building a stronger church. Your presence wells up within us, and we find it here at this communion table. As we accept this cup from this table, let us remember that the life that it represents, the life that it gives. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection assures us of life ever at, everlasting. We are thankful for this cup and for your promises. We pray, amen. When Jesus sat at the table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. And after the meal, he took wine and he blessed it and he poured it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my blood shed for you. Each time you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, remember me. Let us so remember the one we call Christ, the one we call Savior, the one who is the center of our faith as we gather for this holy meal as a holy family in God's name.
you know, when you're the worship leader, you see what the scripture is going to be and the title of the sermon, but you very rarely know what the content is going to be. So you always feel good if it works out that you've kind of hit on the same message. And we've been discussing in our elders meetings the fact that tithing isn't just about money. And I want to talk a little bit about that today. The scripture says when one gives himself to the Lord, he is willing to do all other things the gospel teaches. This is from 2 Corinthians 8, 5. And the truth is, if we have really given ourselves to the Lord in some way, form, or fashion, we will be a giver. We may not be rich, and there are a lot of us, especially when we're younger or when we have families, when we're college students, that fits us as a criteria. But it will still be our desire to help others who are in need. The story goes that a woman asked, can people tithe without directly giving money? And the response was, of course. People tithe in many, many ways without money being involved. We can tithe of our time, our talents, and our treasures. Now, how have people tithed to you in the past two weeks, if you look at it? How have you tithed to others? And what have you tithed to God? I want to take the tithing of our time as a case study. There are 168 hours in one week, if my math is still correct. If you were tithing at 10%, that would mean 16.8 hours given over to some godly or worshipful giving or doing. Now that sounds like a lot to many of us, but it isn't when you start thinking about it, because almost everyone has tithed a part of their time and you don't even realize it. For example, did you send a card to someone who is ill? Did you spend 15 minutes a day in prayer for our church, our community, our world? If you did that, that's almost two hours in a week. Did you take someone a meal who was shut in? Are you planning to help cook for the spaghetti dinner today? Did you attend the church dinner and state of the church last Sunday? When we do something for others, we are acting in response to God's command through Jesus. He said, by this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Expressions of love are not just gifts of money, but also of our time. As we collect these gifts today, Think about what you share that is beyond your treasure and what is beyond what you place in this offering tray. Think of the tithe you give to God as part of your discipleship. Let us now share our gifts of time and talent and treasure with God.
Shall we pray? Most awesome God, these offerings are physical representations of our offerings to you. We add to them the tithes of time and talent and prayer that your church may grow and all will know that we are your disciples by our love. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. We come to that moment in our worship service where we can make promises, we can commit to being the amazing people to our amazing God. If anyone would like to become a member of First Christian Church as we sing our closing hymn, I invite you forward as we can do that and then welcome you into the congregation no matter what. This hymn is for all of us to prepare ourselves to go out into the world to live faithfully as called. Our last hymn is number 595, Be Thou My Vision, and it's printed in the bulletin that we would sing only verse 4. So we will sing only verse 4. Let us sing. Again, thank you for braving the cold and the wet to be here. May this day be amazing for you, and may this week be as amazing as possible. I give thanks to all of us for our safety here. No, I give thanks to God that we were all safe coming here and that God will um, keep us safe as we go. We pray for those who are still coming back from Springfield. My friends, go in peace. Be amazing, faithful followers of the one who has the authority that can live in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.